Hey, this is a short episode of the HVAC School Podcast. I'm Brian, and this is the podcast that helps you remember some things that you might have forgotten along the way, as well as helps you remember some things you forgot to know in the first place. And today we're talking about, well, that system is undersized, and that's something that I hear too often, and we're going to talk about why I'm sick of hearing that and what you can do about it. But before we get into that, I want to thank our sponsors, NAVAC. They make all kinds of great tools, a lot of them that we use at Kalos. I've especially been enjoying the battery-powered flaring tool from NAVAC. You can find it by going to truetechtools.com, T-R-U-Tech-Tools.com. Big thanks to Refrigeration Technologies for all of their support. They make Nylog, they make Big Blue, they make the Viper Cleaners, they even make some hand wipes. They come in a nice little convenient tub. They smell great and they do the job like all of the different products made by Refrigeration Technologies. You can find out more from them by going to refrigetech.com. I want to thank Air Oasis for their support. They make some really good air purification products, the Nano and the Bipolar. You can find out more at aeroasis.com forward slash go. And then last but not least, I have to mention our new sponsor of the podcast, Field Peace. It might be a surprise to some of you, but I have always enjoyed many Field Peace tools. And especially lately, I've been enjoying their vacuum pump and their recovery machine. And I've mentioned this to many of you. I did a video on this. I really think they're excellent, excellent tools. So the VP85 is the vacuum pump that we like. We use a lot of those at Kalos. It's got a really nice oil change on the fly. It's very quiet. I love where the ports are oriented, kind of at a 45 degree angle on the side. It's a DC motor. And then also the MR45 is a recovery machine. Again, both of them very light, very quiet, very easy to use. I really like the digital display on the MR45 for recovery. It makes the process a lot easier. In fact, you can even recover without the need to even hook up your gauges if you don't want, which is comes in handy sometimes, especially if you don't want to contaminate your gauges if you're worried that it's burned out refrigerant because it's got that digital display right there. It tells you when you get down to level and it'll even shut itself off at a predetermined point if you so desire. So that's the Fieldpiece VP85 and MR45, and you can find those at True Tech Tools as well. Use the offer code GETSCHOOLED for a great discount. All right, so here we go. We're talking about the system is undersized, or the technician who says it's undersized, right? That's the answer that technicians give sometimes when they show up to a house and they look at the tonnage and it doesn't seem like it matches their idea of what proper sizing should be. And unfortunately for a lot of technicians, that's 500 square foot per ton. So you go to a 2,000 square foot house and it's got a three ton unit and they say, well, by golly, ma'am, the reason why your unit isn't cooling properly is because it's undersized. It drives me crazy. But there are more circumstances where this whole you're undersized comes up and more than just circumstances where a technician who misunderstands load calculation. So let's first just mention quickly, this kind of dovetails on last week's podcast. We were talking about you and R factors. The way that we do a load calculation on a home, the way we know how much heat to remove or add to a home, and specifically we're talking about removing heat here in the case of cooling, but it works just as easily the other way, is that we have to factor in how much heat is entering or leaving the building So temperature difference between the desired inside temperature and the outside temperature becomes a really big factor when we talk about heat escaping or entering the space. So that's something we have to think about. We have to think about insulation. But then we also have to think about gains, heat gains on the inside of the space. Now, heat gains happen quite often. So you have people living in a space when you're trying to cool the space. You have electronics, so on and so forth. But you very rarely have heat losses on the inside of a space. In fact, I can hardly think of a circumstance where you would have heat losses on the inside. Maybe when uh, little Timmy likes to play with dry ice in his laboratory. I don't know. That's the only way I can think of you actually losing heat in the inside of a space. This would come up in maybe a high rise in a big city where you have all this glass and so you have heat coming in from the sun and then you have heat being generated on the inside and it may be very cold outside, but by the time you figure out the internal gains and the radiant gains, you may not need heat. You actually may need cooling and that's where A lot of times you can use the free cooling from the outside via an economizer to help compensate for that. But in residential applications, we see heat load from the inside, we see heat load from the outside in cooling mode, and then we see losses to the outside in the heating mode. And so there's a lot of different factors to take into account, but it's all about heat gains and heat losses. It has nothing to do with the square feet of the space or even the cubic feet of the space for that matter. There are some approximations, some rules of thumb that may be used in certain geographies. Obviously, it varies from location to location, but those are certainly not absolute, and they're very unscientific. And so when a technician goes to a regular residential house, we'll just give an example here, and that's a 2,000-square-foot house, and they see a three-ton unit, sometimes they're going to say, well, I've been in a lot of these houses, and three-ton is just too small. 
And that may be the case. This is what I want to point out. That it may be the case that three tons of cooling is not enough to cool that 2,000 square foot house. Or it may be the case that it is, but sometimes you're going to go to a house as a technician and it's having a hard time keeping up in either the summer or winter. So it's not heating enough in the winter or it's not cooling enough in the summer. And so the technician diagnoses that by golly, you need a larger unit. Or in some cases, the customer will have already self-diagnosed that. They talked to their neighbor and they got the professional or unprofessional opinion from somebody who's not in the trade that their unit is undersized. Or maybe a salesman does it. Maybe a salesman goes out, they talk to the customer, the customer's unhappy with how their old system has been performing. I've lived in this house for 10 years and I've never been happy with how it cooled the house. I want to keep it 72 degrees even when it's 98 outside, that sort of thing. And so the salesperson wants to put a bigger unit in. Here's my encouragement. If you can help it, don't put a bigger unit in. I've talked about this in previous podcasts, but it just bears saying again, if you can help it, don't put a bigger unit in. And a lot of times you can help it because sometimes the equipment's just not working right. So it's just as simple as getting the equipment working properly. That's the most simple. The system's not undercharged or maybe it has a dirty filter or some other airflow problem, you know, dirty blower wheel, dirty evaporator coil, something like that. And that's what was causing it not to cool properly. And so that's fairly obvious for a technician, but you'd be surprised how many techs don't go through everything. And so let's talk about some other things that you got to go through before you tell a customer that it's undersized. And by the way, I don't think you should generally do that anyway, because there's always options of how to solve problems that doesn't involve oversizing equipment or increasing the size of equipment. So the first thing would be, let's look at the sensible and latent load on a space. So first off, let's say you do a load calculation and you find out that it is too small. Well, let's look at, is it too small on the sensible side? meaning temperature, regular conductive heat gains, or is it too small on the latent side? Is it that you have more moisture than you need? And it's really important to figure out when you're sizing equipment, is it the latent that's the issue, the moisture load, or is it the sensible side? So because sometimes you can fix that just by making some airflow adjustments, system airflow adjustments. If you increase airflow, on a system, you will generally increase the sensible heat. I mean, that's up to a point. There comes a point where it becomes diminishing returns and you really can't get 100% of your total rated capacity with just sensible. But sometimes speeding up the blower, especially if you're in a drier climate or you don't have a lot in the way of latent loads, you can speed up the blower, get a little more capacity out of it. And that's an option in some cases. If the issue is latent, sometimes you can slow down the blower and remove a little more moisture. So that's one thing is let's look at, is this problem that the customer's experiencing related to moisture, their relative humidity is too high, they're uncomfortable because of that, or is it sensible? Because if the issue is relative humidity, you do not want to oversize that equipment. You do not want to increase the size because when you increase that capacity, you are generally, in most circumstances, going to increase the relative humidity because you're going to decrease the runtime. So that's something to think about. The next thing is, let's look at leakage. Leakage is enormous. Leakage both in the ducts as well as leakage that we call infiltration, which is air that's coming in from outside or other unconditioned spaces into the space. So I'll give you a quick story. I was working in a house where the customer has, for the previous five years had said that it just wasn't keeping up, just wasn't cooling properly. And we had actually been there a couple times as well, my company. And finally, I just, I went up in the attic and I didn't see anything at first, but I crawled way back and I actually found that where the return came in to the main box, it was actually almost completely disconnected in the attic. So it had been running for who knows how long, drawing in attic air. Now, we should have saw that. We should have saw it on the return side. But for whatever reason, we didn't catch that. It was maybe five, six degrees difference, and we didn't pick that up when we measured our return temperature. So it's something that could have been caught without even having to do that visual inspection. But of course, that solved the problem once we got that repaired. So looking at duct leakage is huge. Looking at infiltration is huge. Do you have giant holes to the outside or into the attic or into the floor space where you have communication from the inside air with the outside air? Do you have a lot of can lights? Can lights are notorious for allowing air infiltration through them. So that's something to look for. Is there, on the infiltration side also, doors and windows? Are there big gaps and cracks around your doors and windows? Are the door sweeps in place? All of these things can have a big impact both on your sensible and your latent loads. And when you have a house that's not keeping up, those are the things I want to look at. Next would be insulation. Insulation is enormous. Again, another similar circumstance. I actually was working at a professional golfer's house in Windermere. And they had been living in the house a couple years, and they said, this unit is clearly undersized. It's not keeping up. I popped my head up in the attic, and one section is a big house, so there's different sections of the attic. But this one section of the attic that clearly nobody had checked, and there was no insulation in the attic whatsoever. They just never insulated. So insulation is a huge factor. Attic ventilation is a huge factor. If you have an unconditioned attic space, 
and it isn't properly ventilated where you don't have high-low ventilation like you're supposed to, that can result in a higher attic temperature, which means that you have more gains from the attic into the space. So these are all things that factor in to does the system keep up. Even things like shading in the windows, are you closing the drapes, are you closing the blinds, is there tinting on the windows, is there a tree shading that side or, or not? Obviously, the direction that the house faces is going to make a big difference. Those southeastern and southwestern exposures are going to get hit at different times of the day. So the south is kind of the direction, at least in our part of the world, where the sun sort of swings. So the south tends to get it a combo of some sunlight most of the day, but then obviously the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So in the morning, that southeast corner is going to get a lot of heat, and in the evening it's going to be the southwest corner. Well, if you have a master bedroom that's sitting right in the southwest corner with a bunch of open glass, well, then you're going to have a lot of radiant gains in that room right before the occupants go to sleep, and that's going to tend to be a problem there. So you could have a big improvement on your cooling if they put an awning on that side or some other method of shading. Heck, even if they put a tree up outside that side of the wall, that can really help, or maybe some window tinting, so maybe some new drapes. There's a lot of different things that can be done, and if you can think in this way, then the solution doesn't always have to be increasing the size of the air conditioner. Now, why do I not want you to increase the size of the air conditioner? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but the most obvious is, is that replacing an air conditioner with a larger one is rarely that simple. It's really just as simple as pulling out the condenser, pulling out the air handler, slapping in a, a half ton larger, a ton larger, because you have all the old ductwork, which is very possibly undersized in the first place, and now you're going to try to push more air through it. You have your copper line sizing, you have your wire sizing, and then you have the physical dimensions of where you're going to fit this air handler or furnace, which can also be a, an important consideration. So especially for salespeople, or if you're a sales technician, if you do sales and you're a tech as well, you really, really, really try not to put in larger equipment. That's going to be my suggestion. Even if the equipment is undersized, I would look at the customer and propose to them maybe some options of reducing loads in some way, whether it's insulation, whether maybe you do insulation, maybe you can do a little bit of sealing. This is a small change, but you can do things like changing lighting from incandescents or halogens to LEDs or compact fluorescent. The kitchen and bathroom ventilation is huge from a latent load standpoint. So putting in higher performance bath fans that maybe have humidity sensing or occupancy sensing in them um, is an option. Even instructing the customer on how to use a kitchen range where you're not going to use that exhaust hood unless you're cooking, obviously. You don't want to run it too long, but then also you want to run it anytime you are cooking. Maybe putting it on a timer switch would be an option. So that way it will automatically run for only a certain period of time and not run too long. There's a lot of things like this that you can do because obviously if you have somebody taking a shower or cooking, you want to vent out that moisture, but then you don't want it running longer than that because then you're going to be infiltrating more from the outside whenever you have those big fans running. So it's a lot of things like this. This is all kind of building science stuff. This is the stuff that Bill Spohn talks a lot about on the Building HVAC Science podcast or Christoph with Positive Energy tends to talk about it on his Building Science podcast. This isn't all HVAC stuff, but it is very practical for a technician because here's what I don't want you to do. Once again, I don't want you upsizing equipment. Now, as an absolute worst case scenario, if you have a space that is just undersized and it needs a bigger piece of equipment, well, then what I'm going to suggest doing is find a section of the house that's mission critical, like a master bedroom or an office or a game room or something like that and branch that off and install another system on that segment. That way it gives you some zoning control. It's also a good opportunity to maybe talk to them about ductless, because in a lot of cases, a single zone ductless system may be more practical from a cost standpoint. And now that they make a lot of brands, Carrier, Mitsubishi, the two-wheel deal, they both make really nice ceiling cassettes, recessed ceiling cassettes. Sometimes that's an option if they don't want to have the wall-mounted type of design. So a lot of things like that that I would suggest that you consider rather than taking the old box it's maybe it's a three ton and making it to a four ton or a three and a half. I just don't suggest doing that unless you have exhausted every other possibility and it's the only way to go, even if that equipment is at the end of its life. Upsizing equipment causes more trouble generally than it solves. And I'm just here to encourage you to not just think in terms of it being undersized. Think about your loads. Think about how the equipment's working. Think about infiltration from the outside and look for ways to reduce heat both latent and sensible, rather than just throwing more air conditioning at it. All right, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time on the HVAC School Podcast. <laughs>